Yes, so welcome. Um, short introduction. Um, uh, my name is Jopta Haas, like I said. Um, I work for a company called Riscure. We uh, specialize in security testing of devices, so embedded systems. Um, we also make a, a product range uh, that focuses on side channel and fault injection. And, um, but we also do a lot of software reverse engineering and all kinds of stuff. And I've been doing it for too long, basically. So what I'm going to talk about is Secure Boot. Uh, first, an introduction, what, like scoping it, like uh, uh, Michael said, it's, it's for PCs, for BIOS, but also for embedded devices. And then I basically have a long list of things that I one day drew up because I wanted to advise people on, on Secure Boot and because I saw so many things go wrong. And the list got longer and longer, so now I try to put it into a presentation, but it's still a long list. I made a distinction between hardware and logical, but of course it's all one big bunch in the, in the end in the device, so the distinction is not that easy to make. Um, and in the middle, I, of course, I have a demo because I like to play with stuff and I like to do it live. Um, uh, and this is uh, showing you a, a glitch, uh, but we'll get to that in the middle. So secure boot, like I said, I'm not going to talk about Microsoft lockdown, UEFI secure boot. Um, not that it doesn't apply, but it's just, just not my area of expertise. And actually there's very interesting work by Mitre, uh, Butterworth and, and um, Corey, I forgot his last name, have very interesting presentations on BIOS secure boot mistakes and faults that are currently in all our systems. Basically there's hardly any secure BIOS around. But I'm not focusing on that at the moment. So what I do look at is devices, and basically all these devices have a means to prevent unauthenticated code being installed on it, to protect their secrets, to uh, protect their secure functions uh, and, their, and their, you know, code, content, whatever. And, uh, well, you already recognize a few things that you would like to hack because you like the content. Um, and that is, I think, the, the uh, main point to take away from Secure Boot. I don't want to get too political, but um, it is a double-edged sword. Because what is it used for, typically, um, for devices? And why is it uh, protecting against attackers? Well, because they're carrying it in their pockets all day, or it's in your home, it's your entertainment system, and you want to hack it. It's the users they want to protect against. On the other hand, if I lose my device, or if my device is connected to the internet, I also don't want other people to abuse my system. I don't want the NSA to backdoor my system. I don't want to go to China and, and have my laptop broken into in, in my hotel room. So I also have a personal interest in a good secure boot. So both sides on the, on the fence have an interest, but of course it can be used to deny a user, a legitimate user access to their own hardware. Just to remember. So, so what is secure boot? Um, basically, it is a very simple mechanism. You have a root of trust. Typically, it's an internal key in the, in the ROM or in a, in, a, in a system. And it is used to verify a next stage by a digital signature. So you make a digital signature of the code you want to uh, execute. Before you execute it, you take the digital signature, you verify it's good, and then you execute that stage. So you go to the first stage. And you can do this multiple times. Actually, we hardly ever see an internal system check a signature and then never again. There's always these stages. Anyone know why there are stages? Why you make it complicated? So the, the real interesting effect is that you can delegate trust. <coughs> you can have some other key signed by your key, and the private key is then owned by someone else. So you can have a manufacturer of a chip that can delegate trust to a device manufacturer. And the device manufacturer can delegate trust to a software vendor. And so it is nice for, let's say, the business side to be able to delegate this trust. So you get these multiple stages. And sometimes there are many. Of course, with a chain, we know all security and a the chain. There's only one word, it's weakest link. So that also applies here. So how does it go in practice? So what you get is, it is also used for other things than delegating trust. It is also used to release privileges along the way. So now we get these devices with ARM and with Trust Zone, a trusted execution environment, you may have heard of it. 
it's all in all our smartphone these days, we have a trusted execution environment that is using Trust Zone to, to protect it. Um, and that is initialized in the very early stages, and then the, the privileges are released. Uh, so all the code after that will run at a lower privilege level. So now secure boot attacking becomes interesting because if you want to get in the privilege level, you need to find the flaw early enough, or you need to go back into the privilege layers. Um, and in the end, of course, you get U-boot and your Android kernel, for instance, and, and you can still have a userland exploit that exploits your device. So it's still secure booting, but it's still insecure. So it doesn't mean that if you have secure boot, it, your device is secure. Um, but it, it gives you a, a few certain features that, that are nice. Um, if it fails, you get arbitrary code execution, of course, at any of the privilege levels where you manage to break it. Um, but often it's not very persistent. So because the root of trust, the key hasn't changed often. So it still can be difficult to, to reboot the system and still be uh, exploited. Typically a system that has a good few first stages can, can retain or recover its, its security. Um, but sometimes not. If you can, can by getting a high privilege, um, flip something that then makes the device think uh, it's a test device or something like this, then it might be a persistent attack. So it differs how the secure boot exploit uh, uh, can have its effect. What it does give you often is a stepping stone. Because um, uh, let's say at an early stage, your ROM is not readable anymore, then later you break it, you can extract the ROM code temporarily, use that as a stepping stone. Uh, sometimes these codes are encrypted, you can get the decrypted version, you can then exploit it. So a stepping stone is certainly uh, an effective you know, result from a secure boot attack. Okay, uh, 20 ways to was the title of my talk. Uh, I don't know even why I thought that. Well, I, th I had 10 problems and then I had 15 problems, so I thought, well, that's nice. I will send in a talk um, 20 ways. I think I need to switch off my phone, someone told me. I'll put it away. Um, in the end, well, 20 ways is just uh, a number, and I just try to um, um, find enough of them. Uh, there's no really uh, a logic way how I uh, you know, present them. I, I made a rough shift between hardware and logical, but there's no real priority. Of course, I try to leave some of the more interesting ones to the end, but, but basically there's no master plan behind this list. Um, other than maybe it's a dirty, cheap way to promote my business. Good, we start. Hardware-related attacks. So the simplest one that we see still in many embedded devices, JTAG. Um, it's a debug interface, and I think these days, you know, when I started this stuff like 10, 15 years ago, not too many people took things apart. These days, everyone takes stuff apart, and the two things you look for, JTAG and UART. But JTAC is still there, it's a debug interface, and it's still used a lot um, in, in, in phone recovery and in all kinds of things. Um, it gives you a full debug you know, capability of a device, which can, in principle, uh, break the whole secure boot chain. That's simple. I have 20, so I have to rush a bit. So if you think, what's the guy rushed, then it's true. Um, then the second one, the UART. So uh, a UART is a service interface. Um, and why do the people leave it on their, on their board? Because they want to surface when it comes back and it's broken. Uh, you want to debug something. The big question is why do you put it in your production device? Can you not add it later? But if it's broken, sometimes it's hard to put stuff on there. Um, this is a nice example. The, the, the Nuke, which was an e-reader for, I think, Barnes & Noble. Um, so they had a, a UART and they had U-Boot doing signature checking. So actually U-Boot was doing signature checking but you still could, could get the prompt. So you would get the prompt, and then you would, uh, with memory write, just erase the signature check, and then you reboot. So it, it, yeah, why do you put signature checking in a U-boot that pro uh, gives the same services to remove it? Um, this is still the very simple stuff where people already try to do something, but they really do not have the concept yet. Um, this is also an interesting one. Uh, uh, many devices support booting from different sources. 
So you can boot from a flash chip, or you can boot over a spy bus, or you can boot over USB, or you can boot over the UART. Um, for some reason, there's also the option then to boot with different privileges or without signature checking. So uh, people that do ECUs found that there's a boot pin for a famous chip in, the, uh, in, in these devices, I think a Renaissance chip or a Bosch, I don't know. Um, and then it doesn't check the signatures. So you, they use this, this pin is somewhere hidden on the PCB, so they make this whole jig so the people in the garage can do it. You just shove in the ECU, the pin is automatically found, and then you can flash and reset all the settings in your ECU so that you can drive faster and stuff like that. A very famous one, um, and also uh, uh, has been present for a long, long time because uh, in embedded systems often there was not the ability to do much about this. Um, these days the chips are stronger and have more memory, also internal memory, they become a bit better. But the idea is that if you check this integrity of, of code, then when you start executing it, there's a time difference. In between the time, it should not be possible for the attacker to change the code. Because you cannot really execute the code when you execute, or verify the code when you execute it. So there's always a time of checking and there's a time of execution. If you have external flash storage, like a NOR flash, like in the old phones, then it was a matter of intercepting the bus, waiting till the check was over, and then when the execution started, you start flipping bits. And a very famous guy called Dejan Kaljevic made a device that was a very simple uh, uh, COPD logic that monitored one data bit for a pattern of execution and would flip one bit. And that one bit would change um, the signature and he could turn this into a persistent attack. So you had only to do this once and then the phone was unlocked. That's, uh, and we have seen this in, in pay TV a long time, but typically it is now uh, solved by loading the code in, in RAM so, or, or protecting the memory interface itself. But loading code in RAM, also DRAM is an external bus, so you may be just shifting the problem to a faster bus. Flash bus is really slow, easy to attack. DRAM bus a bit more difficult. Um, but you may be just replacing the problem. OK, uh, timing attacks. Um, why is it a physical attack? Well, in, in, in an embedded uh, device, when you're booting, typically you, you have to measure some physical signals to understand that this is happening. The idea is that if you do an HMAC signature, then your signature is basically 20 bytes and you just calculate it and compare it to the stored value in your update or in your firmware. Um, if you quit comparing after the first fail, failed byte, then you can start seeing a difference. And this was uh, uh, found in the Xbox 360. So a very famous timing attack uh, in the gaming uh, industry. So the way they executed it, you, they sold these boards. So they used a small FPGA. Um, you had to solder the wires to the NAND flash and a few selected wires on the board. So you, they used the post condition, uh, which is an error code of the system booting. So it could detect when the error code or the error state was uh, happening. And that time it took from boot to the error code is what they used for the timing attack. And then they used this simple logic. Um, <coughs> you write in the NAND flash the, the, the image, which is not signed and you start all the, the, the hash bytes at zero, and you just start measuring the time. So the first time, the first byte is, well, um, 254 of the two, or 55 of the 256 is wrong, so it will have uh, a certain time. And then you will start increasing the byte, one, two, three, four, five, until it's a bit later. Uh, because then the check is okay for the first byte and the second byte will be wrong. And you just start iterating that byte, and then the next certain moment, it will be a bit slower because that second byte is good. And so it goes on. And this uh, was automated by that small board. It took about two hours to brute force because you have to write NAND and reboot. So it, it still takes a while, but uh, two hours. And then you have you know, permanent attack because you have a full signature on your, or on your code. OK, um, another hardware attack. Glitch uh, sensitivity. So 
and now we get already in a bit more manipulative uh, uh, attacks, let's say. So glitching, um, for those who don't know, is, is a way to externally uh, manipulate a system to make it do something else. Uh, and the stimulus may be anything. So you can use uh, a voltage dip. You can use uh, laser light on the die. Um, you can use electromagnetic waves. Uh, you can even use radiation. Um, so I'm not sure if people have seen the CCC uh, this year with uh, the two guys from Infineon. They have experimented with radiation by putting that close to the chip and obtaining similar effects that, that I will demo uh, shortly. So um, there are different things you can glitch, of course, because glitching really works at the gate level, at the transistor level. So a, trans a transistor or a group of transistors will go left instead of right, and they will do other stuff. What that really means for, for a target um, depends on the design. Um, in our example now, we will look at code. And basically, the instruction engine of the chip will do something else than intended. Um, and it is a matter of finding those faults that cause it to do something that is still meaningful. So you don't want it to crash and freeze up, but you, <coughs> you want a, a, a meaningful change. Um, what can you do about that? Well, because you're still uh, influencing code flow, you could construct your code in a way that it is m more resilient to these faults. Uh, if you do an if statement on some condition, you could construct if statements that um, use the conditions in uh, multiple ways to make sure that, for instance, a single fault cannot uh, cause you to, to uh, go in the wrong way. Um, well, there's all kinds of examples. We have a paper on our website also to show some of the, the mitigations uh, that you can do. Um, typically, because you have all this physical stuff around it, it's not a persistent attack. You can do it, but then if you boot your device again without the glitch, it will still do the old stuff. So um, it's not so uh, trivial to make something that will repeatedly um, a glitch a device all the time. Um, later, uh, other attacks uh, were seen uh, on the PS3, where they glitched uh, access to a memory bus, or uh, the Xbox 360, where they did uh, a, a glitch on the reset line. So the reset line was pulled low, but for a very short moment, let's say out of spec, and not the full system went into reset. So there are all kinds of these like mishaps that happen in systems when you start playing outside. So in a sense, you can compare this a bit to the previous talk with uh, the packets and the airwaves that, yeah, things slightly go out of, uh, out of spec and then things start to happen that you don't want. And as soon as you start to be able to control these effects, um, they become a danger. So how does this work? What do I have here? Um, I have a, a board, and it's a very simple example. So to um, yeah, maybe take the magic away a little bit, it's all rigged here. <laughs> it's all a demo. Um, the good thing is it works very uh, well uh, because of that, um, but it is not super realistic. Um, what we have is a board, and um, it has a reset line. We can reset it, and it is an AVR chip, an X mega chip, so it runs at 32 megahertz. And we have some code on there, and I will show you shortly, that we can you know, show to go in different directions. Is this a real attack, you think? Well, um, actually it is. Uh, when I was just going over the internet to see what other people were doing in uh, EM uh, glitching, I came across this kind of uh, devices. Um, so they put in a few 9-volt batteries and a nice loop. You can see that a uh, fluorescent light lights up if you, if you glitch it. And then, OK, but what do you do with this coil? Well, they do this. Let's see if it works. So I don't know if there's sound. But um, this is a slot machine. So you put the coil in the coin entry. And then ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you get money. <laughs> So, and there are several videos on the internet doing this. So apparently there are vulnerable slot machines to this kind of trick. And, and it's just the impulse apparently gives the, um, the money system uh, a jolt and it thinks money is entered into the system. 
So, so the good thing about this attack is you don't need timing, you don't need triggering. It, is, it looks pretty robust. I don't know, I haven't tried how many of these systems work in the field, but, but uh, anyway. So just to give some kind of you know, background of, yeah, is this a realistic attack? Um, uh, we do test this for, for customers, so it, it is something that uh, uh, yeah, people are aware of. So a little view at the code. Uh, what is the code doing? So I said it is rigged, so it's a fake signature. You have a Boolean, and the Boolean is true. Then it says, ah, I'm secure. I'm booting, and it will go on. Uh, and it will print, let's go. Um, if the Boolean is false, then it says, oh, uh, it's insecure. This is not good. I will go into a while loop. I uh, will we'll stay there. So um, the idea is uh, false software was loaded onto this target, so now the secure boot will be false if I run this. Okay. Let's see. Oh, yeah. What is the setup? Um, we have a workstation with some software. We have a box that is uh, FPGA based for the timing of the pulse. And then we have this thing here, which is an EMFI, uh, electromagnetic fault injector, um, which is basically a coil um, where you discharge a large current into the coil and gives an EM field very locally uh, beneath, the po uh, beneath the coil. Um, I didn't want to carry this whole XY stage thing, so I manufactured uh, something else uh, that holds up the probe. It still works because I can do it manually uh, here. And so, well, the tip is a bit closer. Um, I will show, I think, oh yeah, this is what are the probes like. So we experimented a bit uh, with, with probe tips. Uh, we are now look, uh, using the most left one. So it's a ferrite uh, with a one loop coil uh, around it. And that is where the current is discharged through. And you have to think in the order of uh, uh, 50 to 100 amp, but very short. So like uh, 10, 20 nanosecond pulses. So it's um, yeah, because it was all on the desk, I didn't know I would have a camera. So I had a small video with that. Well, actually, I think I can show it like this. Uh, maybe yeah, the camera can be turned on. Then, um, uh, both at the same time, please. Because then I can show on the other screen. Uh, let's see if that works. Uh, the software, oh, yeah, if it want to move, where is it? Okay, so this is the control tool, and what I will first show, uh, let's see, what can you see here? Okay, so it's a bit difficult to see, let me get, so basically, uh, this is too dark, let me show, well, you can see the tip here, my finger, there. There. So this is the tip, and I can move it like this. So now it's next to it, and now it's on, on top of the chip. So basically, I will start next to it. So you can see what it does when everything is good. And basically, I have some control software, but everything is prepared. I can show that we have some settings here where we can say, um, now I have to look there. So we can say how many tries we want to do. We can say what the offset is. Actually, I think it needs to be this, 174. Um, the length is doesn't matter, and I can install some, uh, configure some power of the of the pulse. Basically, if I run it now, the, oh, good thing demo. <laughs> Plug in wires. Okay. Let me see. Now I have to go there and there and there. Where is it? Let me verify that. No, no this is gone. Okay. Yeah. So basically, what it's saying, I'm insecure booting. It's shown as green, so I have another color if something else happens. So I will stop this for a moment because now I need to coordinate it a bit with moving that target. Run it one more time. So 
So now I put the tip over the chip, and now we see things happening. So depending on the position, here now I'm getting almost com all the time secure boot, let's go. So this is this, the, the other if uh, statement, right? If I put it away, you will see the green ones again. And sometimes you will see yellows, which means crash. Actually, not too many. Ah, yeah, here. So now it resets. So that this means now it's at the position where the, the, the waves apparently do something that the device is completely crashing. So it is position dependent, but it's also not too bad that I can still do it manually. It, in, in our testing, we see that for certain chips, we, you really want to have like almost micrometer step sizes. So it can be very sensitive depending on the, the, the scale of the chip. This is a microcontroller. Things typically are a bit easier. So, so this works. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea about the um, sensitivity, I can add to this. So. I set the, um, the, the offset of the, the glitch at 174 nanoseconds since some event. Um, but we saw two uh, statements. We had the red arrow at the Boolean if, but we also have the, uh, the while loop at the end. So now I'm moving the glitch to the while loop. So I know that that roughly should be something like, um, what was it? Maybe I'm now confused. Uh, three, eight, seven, eight. I think so. So something like three milliseconds later. So in time, quite a bit later. And I will toggle this. You can see what it says. Ah, oh, there. Are, so now we see something. It says insecure booting, but let's go. So again, if I move it around, so ah, there's an area where it's very sensitive. So again, depending on the place, it's more sensitive, but now we are glitching another point. So you see that in code, you will have to cover multiple points uh, to prevent this kind of attack. So if, if, your, if your code is sensitive to a certain fault at some place, then you may have a countermeasure, but you still have to have all the places covered that this might go wrong. And that actually is hard work. Um, in smart card business, this is, um, default that you have to do this because device glitching is something is very difficult physically to protect against. So uh, developers in the smart card area all are doing mitigation of fault injection and, and have a focus on how to, to do that. Okay, I think that was my demo. Let's switch back to the slides. Um, that is like this. Yeah, so the video can also go. So going back quickly to the code that we saw. So first we saw um, secure booting um, after a glitch. So normally green was insecure booting. We saw secure booting after a glitch. And later we saw insecure booting and then let's go. So that meant that we glitched the while loop that you can individually target different functions. So you can imagine that, that, well, this type of fault and attacks for people that have physical access to your target um, for a secure boot function is a, is a risk. Uh, like I said, it doesn't give you persistence, but it still uh, allows you to have a stepping stone for further attacks. Or it might allow you to steal uh, key material that, that could be persistent. Okay, well. We're not there yet, Log logical. So we have more, uh, 13, well, we're not there yet. So um, design mistakes. Well, design mistakes is a bit of a, a weird category because of course you can put many of the other things I mentioned as design mistakes. So what do I try to say here? Um, things that seem to be, yeah, from a certain intentional point of view um, have a purpose. Sometimes you don't know exactly, but we see things like uh, an empty signature is accepted as a good signature, or uh, having a flag that just allows you to boot without a signature. Um, yeah, you, don't, you wonder why do you put this in a system uh, if you have such a feature. Um, uh, one that I find very um, uh, illustrative is the one that uh, the early iPhone had. 
So the early iPhone would get a firmware with a signature. It would check the signature, then copy it without the signature into its internal memory, throw the signature away, and never check it again because it was gone. Um, well, you can only do that if you put your code in a, a mask ROM or something like that. Uh, something you have really, really high trust you cannot change. But they put it in a NOR flash, which in the end was changeable through multiple ways. Um, which is clearly a design mistake. It's something that someone thought, you know, assumptions made or something. Um, so you really need some review design level already if you make something like this. Um, not so much a flaw, uh, but something that we see um, does have some value uh, for, I want, yeah, delaying or, or um, you know, not unnecessarily um, uh, exposing how uh, things are done. Um, and that is hiding the, the ROM code. So uh, if you do not have the ROM accessible for scrutiny, um, it does delay attackers. And in certain markets, this may matter. So, of course, it's always a matter of what is the time till the next release or the next um, product cycle. Uh, we see that mobile phone cycles go pretty quickly. So, so maybe making this hard will um, you know, be sufficient uh, for a certain uh, type of product. Um, it's, it's not really um, something that is a flaw in itself. Um, another one is uh, crypto sanitation, um, cleaning up after use. Um, the, the thing is that we see crypto being used, uh, of course, for signature verification, which uses sometimes uh, an HMAC key. Um, but we also see the bootloaders being encrypted and being decrypted on, on startup of the system. And then later, the crypto engine is still uh, available to the, to the low level code, the low privilege uh, code. If you still have your key in the key register, you can still keep on decrypting or encrypting with that engine. So, um, yeah, cleaning up your keys after you use them is something that, that most uh, you know, implementations do not do. Um, well, firmware upgrades, uh, also always uh, an interesting area of um, uh, exploration. Um, in the end, if you have an update or if you have the original code, it shouldn't matter. It's the signed code. You need to sign, uh, check the, the signature and you need to make sure that you don't execute anything that was not signed. It doesn't matter where it comes from. So you should worry about the mechanisms that you implement to get that copy into your system because that's where the flaws go. Um, parsing the headers, copying it over other stuff that's already there. Um, that, that is where the flaws are, and not so much in the fact that, of course, you shouldn't make something that accepts unsigned firmware or something, but if you just use the principle of everything that gets executed gets verified first, then uh, in itself it should not be uh, uh, much of a hurdle. Still, a lot of phone and, and game systems uh, had flaws in this, uh, in this area. And things like rollback. So you have a flawed um, firmware once, and then, uh, yeah, people can eternally install that on their system to recover it again. Relying on unverified code. So, um, yeah, this is a bit of a, a um, let's say, a system-dependent situation. Uh, what sometimes happens is that you have uh, a routine that does the verification, the, the RSA signature verification, and then it is copied to another place in the system for speed or for size reasons or for privilege reasons, uh, it is copied. Um, and then you get the, the problem that that copy is maybe not um, uh, immutable anymore. So you can change it. Uh, an example is uh, um, the, 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 the Samsung TV. So Samsung TV uh, had their RSA uh, routine sitting in memory. And uh, if you put an app on your TV, it was in the same memory space as this RSA routine. So you could install a, a, a widget, a simple app, on your fully unprivileged. But just because the memory space was fully unprotected, it would just patch the RSA routine. And then you would put in your USB stick with the firmware upgrade. And the whole RSA signature was not done anymore. Uh, this is a bit similar to the earlier UR thing, um, like a service feature. Uh, 
Uh, here I mention more the fact that you have this authentication problem. So we put the UART somewhere on the board or we have some way to, to do servicing to a device. Um, we realize that we don't want everyone to do it, but now we, have, uh, we want authentication. How do we do this? And that's actually a challenge. Um, for instance, uh, cable, uh, so ECUs again, um, almost all of them work with a fixed magic password. And uh, what the people do that sell these cables is they get an um, official, you know, Peugeot or whatever, and they uh, get the servicing equipment, they get the magic out of that equipment, they store that in a cable, hide it themselves because that is their business model. So you still, you know, have to break the cable to get that key. Um, but, but the cable is now able to talk to your ECU. Why is it like this? Because it is really complicated to make this a dynamic authentication protocol. Um, uh, of course, there are better authentication protocols developed the last you know, five, ten years, but um, still not having the, like an online possibility, which is for a garage shop, not a very uncommon situation, makes it not that trivial to authenticate securely and also make it you know, easily distributable all over the place. But this happens uh, still a lot. State errors. So, um, in itself, um, you know, during secure boot execution, there is not that much space to manipulate state. Uh, but with the um, introduction of suspend resume, um, quite a few more possibilities have uh, come across. Because as soon as you suspend the system, <coughs> excuse me, you need to suspend somewhere. And then when you resume, um, yeah, what are you going to trust? What, what is um, the, the state that was, you know, preserved or what, what I can, can use to reboot or restart my machine? Um, and anything in between, um, uh, yeah, needs to be suspect. And for designers, this is uh, quite a challenge because typically they trust everything um, that they wrote. So um, you see quite a bit of flaws in this area. Um, I, <coughs> I need some water. You can look at this screen because it is, um, it's old, uh, 2003. Um, I was at Hack in the Box uh, um, in October and I realized I spoke there 10 years ago and I didn't remember what. I googled my own slides yeah, and I, uh, thank you, yeah, that's good, thank you very much. <coughs> and I came across this slide and I thought, oh, secure boot. Um, this was the XDA. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember, it was the first PDA phone um, made by HTC. I think it was their first device or something like that. Um, and what you see here, it was a, a patch loader. So this went on a, um, I'm not sure even anymore what kind of card, CF card or SD card. And when you suspended the device, and when it booted again, it would look at what is inserted in my, in my um, EMC or MMC uh, slot, and if there's a magic, again a magic, it would execute whatever was on that stick. Yep. <coughs> so what we <coughs> made was um, something to uh, deactivate the, the lock password. So you have a lock device, you cannot get in, you suspend the device, you put this in, you boot this, you disable the password, suspend again, boot it, and then you were in. And then you could put, uh, turn it back also because it was just a state bit. It just said password is active or not active. You didn't even have to know the password or erase it. It would just you know, toggle it. Well, a very convenient way to get in. Um, <coughs> but it shows the, the typical type of state errors. <laughs> so 10 years ago they were there. They're still here. Well, attack surface, um, drivers. So drive uh, devices these days boot um, about everything. Um, more and more, let's say, peripherals are, are showing up. And it is actually a competitive uh, feature for, for chip vendors. I can boot from more sources than you can. Uh, so you're more flexible and you're better. Um, and of course, the, the problem is you have to parse all these things at the very early stage of booting, making your boot stage uh, bloated and, and, and more difficult to, to, to audit. 
um, and, and more sensitive to flaws. And there are many examples of things that can go wrong here. Okay, um, again, it's one that is not really a flaw, and um, yeah, you can, you can, yeah, there are maybe even advice that I put somewhere else that is actually advising this kind of <laughs> behavior, so it's a bit difficult to say what is right and wrong, um, but I think it is good to um, keep in mind uh, that these mechanisms uh, are powerful in multiple ways, and ROM patching is a, is a method to be able to patch your product in the field, it's used by smart cards a lot, um, if there's a flaw. So uh, swapping a smart card base is, is expensive, so it's much more attractive if you can do a patch in the field. Um, so how is it implemented? Well, you have your ROM code, which is pretty static, but instead of then calling directly your functions in your ROM uh, directly from, from all over the place, you put a table in RAM, or in flash or something mutable, and your ROM just jumps there always. And then there is the function pointer that points back into the ROM, that is the code. Now, when something goes wrong in your ROM, you have a function, you change the pointer in that mutable place to something that is the patch. And then your function is patched and can even jump back into the original code. So it, it is a fairly efficient way to patch something. Of course, if, if your ROM is jumping all over the place into something that is mutable, it's not a ROM anymore from the, the original point of view, um, it's becoming mutable. And, and that is where an attacker can then also make a persistent change to your secure, bo uh, secure boot. So it's very understandable that the feature is there. Um, I mean, it's all about market and business and, and uh, staying alive. Um, also, if you want to have one function that is used, let's say we have a signature verification function in ROM that we trust. It's also very nice if we can use that from all our software later. So you also see a lot of software jumping back into a ROM to have one function that does all the signature verification, which is a strong thing. You don't re-implement, you don't make mistakes in the third loader that you didn't make in the first two. Um, but again, you need a similar construct like this. You need a pointer table that jumps in, into your ROM. So, it's an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Oh, and I get an alert here. I will click away. Okay, well, four to go. Um, decryption is not authentication. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it happens. So, uh, uh, yeah, people think, well, I encrypted it. It is my key. I'm the only one that can decrypt it. If I can decrypt it, I own the key. It's my code. So I authenticated it. Um, but, of course, uh, there are ways to change encrypted code. Um, and if you don't verify that that was changed, then you won't see it. And if I can make changes that still me uh, are meaningful, even though I cannot see it, right? I, I, something is decrypted, I flip something, and then it's decrypted. Well, CBC will XOR some of my changes with uh, some decrypted content, so I can flip bits. Um, an example, uh, also from the same Dejan Kaljevic long ago, um, was the second stage uh, loader in a Nokia phone that was encrypted, but not signed. And uh, they made a patch on that to load an arbitrary. So they, they patched out the signature verification of the encrypted loader by just a two byte change. Um, <clears throat> so always do a separate verification and not only decryption. Um, inappropriate signing area, yeah, that's a bit, uh, well, maybe I should have named this differently because there are multiple things that, that play a role here. Um, the main thing is, of course, do not use information that was not signed <clears throat> because, well, someone might have changed it. Um, it sounds obvious, it happens a lot. Um, why does it happen a lot? And I think that is maybe a slightly, you know, adjacent to this is that one tip is you need to load your code somewhere internally and then verify and then execute because otherwise you have this flash bus attack. But if I need to copy something before I verified it, then how do I know how big it is without checking the length that was not verified yet? So there's this little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Most vendors um, deal with this by having fixed length uh, first loaders 
Um, but then at, at some point you get into this, this problem. You, you have to load something, the size is there, but it is not verified yet because you are copying it before you verify it. Um, well, the, the examples here, uh, the, the boot, um, secure boot flaw in the Samsung Galaxy S4 and the iPhone had also a similar one. So it happens. Key management. Um, if you sign things, they become very valuable. Um, so if you have a, a production bootloader that is for secure boot and that checks the next one and the next one, that is a very valuable thing. If you then sign a development bootloader that does not check the next thing and the next thing, but just loads it and executes it, um, that's pretty bad. Um, so why do you use that same key for these development loaders and for the production loaders? So as soon as you start using a key for development, you cannot use it anymore for production. You need to make a, a key management. So you basically from the first key you generate, you need to have a policy of how are you going to use them and where are you going to store them and how long will they live. And typically people just make open SSL, gen key, ah, I have a key. <laughs> I just use it. Uh, it happens a lot. Yeah, so, um, well, this, this happened in the field. We also saw a vendor do this. I think he was revealed uh, in the meantime. But, um, and the last one, this is still the, it wasn't called epic fail for nothing. I think this is still for me uh, one of the nicest. Um, so this was also at CCC uh, disclosed. Um, yeah, if you use crypto, use it the right way. That is basically what it's about. And they used not a random where you should have used a random. Um, yeah, there, there are more mistakes you can make. Uh, RSA has also has a history from um, uh, wrong padding, uh, low exponent uh, that you could abuse. So um, yeah, understand your crypto before you use it. And people have reasons to always start using other crypto for some reason. So you have you know, reasonable good crypto, but then, well, yeah, this is faster and the boot time is important. So we need something faster. So we take something shorter and, um, or we change to another protocol, which might have been the elliptic curve. And then we didn't understand the, the details of that yet. We knew RSA, but now we use a new one because it's faster and we don't do the due diligence to, to really understand it. Okay, so, well, Finally, we got to one. Um, so a few parting thoughts. So the, the, the most difficult thing in a secure boot design, because like I've shown, there are so many things to think about. It's also a very complex um, uh, functionality for a system. It not only brings up the system, it also has to update the system. It also has to do suspend resume. Um, you really need to look at all these aspects to know what is the right solution. Do I need ROM patch tables or can, can I do without? Um, do I need this debug functionality present always in my device or can I make an upgrade later in the, in the factory where I install my signed debug uh, version? Then, then I don't need to have it in the field. That might make a difference. Um, if you're really high security, if you get keys that are for payment or for other stuff, then you really also need to take into account the hardware related attacks. So, uh, and then not so much a UART or a JTAG, but also glitching and side channel attacks. Um, luckily, proper design principles go a long way. Um, learn lessons from the past. And pay attention to detail. That's not my social security number, I think. <laughs> um, because, uh, yeah, who of you noticed that there were not 20 items? Actually, there was uh, only 19. Off by one. <laughs> Can happen. But I split one in two, I think, along the way. Um, <laughs> um, and that concludes my presentation. So any, any questions? Are there any questions? Ah. <laughs> At least in the first row. <laughs>
Yeah, uh, we don't want you to do sports, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, I think it's fair to say that if you, um, so, so picking up on the developer uh, versus versus production uh, signing and, and similar issues, it's fair to say that if you um, if you open your system um, in in one scenario, for example, developer, uh, then it's really hard to keep it close on the on the other. So, um, in that respect, do you think um, systems that are required uh, to be opened, and I'm thinking about uh, I'm thinking Windows Secure Boot and um, the at least German requirement that there is bootloaders that allow you to boot Linux, um, is defendable at all because you you basically have the same scenario yeah. and there's there's different attempts recently but this is a relatively new problem uh, set of problems and what's what's your gut feeling is this defendable at all yeah, it's a good point so you, you weren't at the start but I had a disclaimer about uh, secure boot for Windows and Microsoft but it's a valid point and um, <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but it's good that I, I have not really thought about this, but it, I would say it is the same problem. Um, I mean, in the end, yeah, you really want to know that the path f to a certain point of software has not been tampered with. And as soon as you can do that, then yeah, all the integrity of the rest of the system falls. And, um, and like I said in the beginning, <coughs> most of these attacks... Um, do not easily turn into persistent attacks. That depends on the rest of the system. Um, but sometimes that is, that is not, um, don't, not needed. If you look at evil mate attacks, where you just have something that runs initially, gives a fake pass screen, and just you know, loses your keys, then, then that is enough. Um, I mean, you have a copy of the disk, because you took that also. <laughs> and then it's, yeah, game over. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Amazing stuff. Thank you.